Good afternoon, good evening, good morning to colleagues from all around the world. And I'm very, very pleased to be able to welcome everybody to the founding meeting of the International Parliamentary Network for Education. My name is Harriet Baldwin. I'm a UK Member of Parliament uh, and a former Minister in International Development where I focused on education. Je veux commencer par dire aux collègues francophones que vous avez une traduction simultanée si vous touchez sur le bouton du monde dans vos contrôles. For everyone else, I would be very grateful um, if you would uh, follow along in English and you will also be able to uh, put any comments that you might have uh, into the chat function uh, on Zoom. And of course, if you require any assistance during the call, uh, then please do use the chat function. And for everyone on the call who's not speaking, I'd be very grateful if you could mute your microphones and uh, we will unmute you when the time comes uh, for you to speak. So one final piece of housekeeping. Uh, this meeting is being recorded and after the meeting we will be putting the recording on all of our social media channels and our website and i'm hoping that this whole meeting uh, will last uh, exactly one hour and 15 minutes so we're, we're joined uh, today by parliamentarians from around the world we have people um, from the west coast of the United States and Canada where it's six o'clock in the morning. We have people in Australia where I think it's 10 o'clock in the evening. And uh, in fact, we have uh, over 70 colleagues from 30 countries who've confirmed their attendance at today's meeting. Many more parliamentarians have signed our founding declaration and are joining as founding members. And my colleague co-chair Senator Dr Musuruve will be updating you all on the number of founding colleagues uh, who have joined the network. We are profoundly grateful to all of you for finding the time in your very very busy schedules to take part in today's launch. As it's the very first meeting I think uh, I have found that many colleagues have been astonished to learn that this is the first global parliamentary network which is dedicated to education. When you think how many networks there already are dedicated to health, I must say I was very surprised to learn that. As you know, we did our soft launch at the end of July and it was at that point that Senator Dr. Gertrude Musuruve Yinima from Kenya, my co-chair and I, and a small secretariat led by Joseph Nano Riley uh, launched uh, the IPNED network with uh, a joint op-ed and I'm very pleased that um, uh, my uh, predecessor Stephen Cook Twig, a former education minister in the UK, is now secretary general of another important parliamentary network, the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association. Uh, in the UK Parliament, I chair our cross-party group that campaigns for global education, the all-party parliamentary group on education. And I know that many of you Lone will be involved in similar networks <clears throat> in your countries. And I know that we will all work together to build the political mm. will to help achieve sustainable development goal number four. So the network today has been established to grow and deepen the political understanding and commitment to inclusive and quality education for all. Today is the first step in launching that process and I'm delighted that in addition to our cohort of esteemed parliamentarians today we are also going to hear from two esteemed political leaders who have an abiding commitment to education. The first person we're going to hear from today is former UK Prime Minister and UN Special Envoy for Global Education, Gordon Brown. And then we're going to hear from Senegal's former Minister for Education, now the Minister for Water and Sanitation, and the Vice Chair of the Global Partnership for Education, Minister Tiam. Both of their remarks have been pre-recorded, and then we will go to live participation from Yasmin Sharif, the Director of Education Cannot Wait, 
the first global fund dedicated to education in emergencies. And then Alice Albright, the chief executive of the Global Partnership for Education, which is the only global fund dedicated to transforming education in lower income countries. Yasmin and Alice will provide expert analysis of the state of play. And following both their presentations, there's going to be an opportunity to make brief interventions and ask questions to our distinguished panelists. To indicate your interest, can you just uh, use the chat function on Zoom and also include your name and the parliament you're calling in from? We want to hear from a wide range of colleagues. And I first want to tee up Gordon Brown. He and I are from different political parties in the UK, but we share a commitment working across party lines uh, to the kind of cross-party working and global working uh, that the International Parliamentary for Network, Network for Education seeks to cultivate. There is so much that unites us, a belief in the power of education. And so it's with great pleasure that we will now hear from the Right Honourable Gordon Brown, the UN Special Envoy for Global Education. Problem with sound? Unmute Zoe. It's great news that parliamentarians from all over the world are coming together in a network to promote the cause of global education. We need universal access to medicines, but we also need universal access to education. You know, hope can die when a refugee ship is lost at sea or when a convoy can't get through with food to a besieged town. But it can also die when we are unable to give young people the hope to prepare, to plan, to have a dream come true about the future. And that's why education is so vital. And it's even more vital at a time when the COVID-19 is reaping such havoc. We expect 30 million children may not go back to school. We are fearful that they will be involved in child labor or they'll be subjected to child marriage or child trafficking. But that means that there will be 300 million children who will not go to school today or any day. It also means because of the substandard nature of some of the education that we offer and the limited finance available, that about a billion children will not be able to read or write by the age of 10 or 11. And that means that so many of them will leave school early without any qualifications whatsoever. We have got to make universal education a right. We have got to become the first generation in history where every single child is able to go to school. Instead of developing some of the talents of some of the children, we have got to develop all the talents of all of the children. And this new parliamentary network can pressurize all the educational institutions of the world, national governments and international organizations to make the dream of education for all the reality. Thank you very much for those passionate introductory remarks. And uh, I would now like to bring in my uh, co-chair from uh, Kenya, Senator Dr. Musuruve, uh, who's going to unveil the number of signatories to this uh, founding declaration, um, whom we have already signed up. And I'm also pleased that both she and I and, the, and, uh, and Gordon Brown were several of the and several other founding members of IPMED were among the 275 world leaders um, who recently called for urgent action uh, to prevent this uh, crisis in uh, education resulting from COVID. Senator Dr. Musuruve from Kenya uh, has such a strong personal commitment. She's the nominated senator representing persons with disabilities in the Kenyan Senate. She herself is an educationalist who's taught in schools, in universities, and has authored several books for deaf learners. So I am honored to pass the floor to my co-chair, Senator Dr. Musaruve. The floor is yours. Thank you uh, very much, my distinguished uh, co-chair, Honorable Harriet. And uh, I want to say that uh, I'm, really, I'm truly delighted to be on this platform with my co-chair, 
Uh, Honorable Harriet uh, is an advocate on education. She has actually done so much uh, in her country. At one point, she was Minister for Education and she was even able to impact uh, you know, girls' education for about 12 years. And I want to say that uh, she also has a global touch and I'm truly humbled to be on the same platform with uh, Honorable Harriet. I want to say that uh, I also want to say that uh, I'm pleased to say that uh, my colleagues from Kenya are here and uh, they're actually represented by the deputy speaker of uh, the Senate, Professor Kamar, who has actually done so much also on education. And uh, she was a minister also in Kenya for higher education. And uh, being the speaker of the Senate, uh, she really impacts so much when it comes to issues of uh, education. And I want to say also uh, on this platform that uh, Professor Kamar is my co-sponsor on a bill that I'm coming up with on uh, signed language that will impact uh, deaf learners. And apart from that, uh, she has also co-sponsored another bill uh, with me. And I want to say that uh, I'm truly humbled also uh, with the support that IPNED has received from Kenya. And uh, even uh, from uh, chair education, I remember just a while ago, we were in a meeting, but the chair reduced the meeting to allow uh, parliamentarians, senators uh, from the education committee to join this global event. So I want to say that IPNED uh, is really, uh, has a really high bar in Kenya. And I want to say that for all of you who have come here to support this cause from all over the world, we have uh, senators from all over the world, we have chairs of departments from all over the world, we have the civil society from all over the world who have come for this uh, you know, important occasion. We also have the media. And I want to say that uh, we are truly humbled as IPNET that uh, you have found time to really come and be with us. So I want to say that uh, I, I'm delighted now to announce that uh, over 120 parliamentarians from 30 countries have agreed to become founding members of IPNET and uh, I want to say that uh, we have over 71 MPs from 25 parliaments, in fact, by today, who have committed to attend this founding uh, meeting. So I want to say that uh, we are happy as IPNED that we have a lot of support globally on uh, the course that we have decided uh, to take. And we do not take it for granted that parliamentarians, civil society, people have left their work just to be here and support us in, uh, uh, you know, in driving the agenda SDG4. We cannot take it for granted and uh, we are truly happy for this. And we want to say that uh, in this particular meeting, we have representation from all over. We have uh, female legislators, we have uh, male legislators, we have young parliamentarians, we have representation even from the underrepresented you know, uh, minorities who have decided to come and support our cause. So uh, we want to say as IPNED that uh, we are not taking it for granted that you have actually come here to support our cause and uh, we are happy that you are ready to uh, to, uh, to take the agenda of IPNED uh, you know, ahead. And uh, it is very clear as IPNED that uh, we have three main priorities. And uh, our priority number one is to see how to finance uh, um, education uh, for the underprivileged. And another priority as IPNED is to ensure that uh, we are reaching the farthest behind child. And another priority also is to ensure quality education for all so that no one is left behind. So we are happy that all of you are here to ensure that we press this agenda, not at local level, not at national level, but from a global perspective. I want to say that... Uh, 
there is a reason why each and every one of you was uh, nominated uh, to come to this uh, this uh, yeah. conference. The uh, one thing you should know is that uh, you have been rated highly as being a champion in education from your own country, and that is why your name was fronted. And we are taking it as uh, with a lot of humility, and we are happy that uh, you have decided now to move away from uh, your regional uh, impact, from your national impact, and you have decided as a legislator now to champion SDG4 from a global perspective. And uh, we are humble as uh, APLED, and we are happy that you're truly here to help us uh, in this agenda. Now, we want to say as IPNET that it is very clear that uh, COVID-19 has had a lot of impact and negative impact on education because there are lots of children who are staying at home. There are lots of children who would have been in school, but because of their socioeconomic background, they're not in school. Because they're underprivileged, they're not in school. I know that quite the speakers who will uh, speak after me will talk generally about uh, the impact of COVID in education. But I want to state clearly, and uh, I will not actually miss my words, that COVID-19 has had drastic and drastic impact on children with disabilities, children from minority groups, and children from the underprivileged areas, and especially uh, in Africa. And uh, with COVID, we see so many children not going to school, even in Africa. Some girls right now, and uh, Harriet will attest to this because she was in Africa at one point, she championed education. There are some girls who are not in school, some of them have been married off by their parents, not out of their will. Some of them are not in school, and this must concern the entire world. I want to say that as IPLED, we want to see that no child is left behind. And before even the, uh, this pandemic, COVID-19, the impact of education on uh, children with disabilities and the underprivileged was very, very uh, negative. Many countries of the world have not really prioritized education of children with disabilities. And I want to say it is even worse, even for uh, children with disabilities now. And we all know the impact that education can have on an individual. Education can transform someone from the low income society, from the underprivileged socioeconomic class, to even sit with the high and mighty. And I want to say that uh, globally, we must take it as a priority to ensure that uh, we are actually rallying uh, the political goodwill, all governments nationally, all governments globally, to ensure that everyone is taking it upon himself or herself to champion the agenda of the underprivileged. And I want to say that uh, in 2015, globally, nations of the world committed themselves to achieving SDG 4 to ensure that everyone accesses education. And when I say everyone, we are talking even about children from low socioeconomic backgrounds. But I want to say that uh, globally, we have not made the promise, we are, we are not even about to fulfill the promise that we made to the entire world of ensuring that everyone, every child has an education. Now we are just about uh, 10 years away from 2030, but I want to say that education of children with disabilities is still at risk. Education of children in refugee camps is still at risk. Education of the girl child is still at risk. And I want to say that politicians who are here, legislators who are here, civil society that is here, it is our honor to ensure that we come together and see how we can salvage this situation. And I'm happy that uh, uh, right uh, Gordon said clearly that we must 
be a generation that is, is impacting the society so that everyone has access to uh, everyone has access to education so i want to say that uh, it is an issue that we must really be keen about it we need the political goodwill of all thank, countries of thank all you. parliamentarians thank you so much senator and um, I, I think everyone can hear the passion the commitment, the leadership, and the action that you are demonstrating in your commitment to global education. It really is unparalleled, and it's a joy to be your co-chair. And I would now like to give the floor to um, hear from Minister Serine Mbe Tiam. Minister Tiam is a former Minister of National Education from Senegal. He was elected the first vice chair of the Global Partnership for Education in 2018. Uh, he's held several positions in education in Senegal, and he's recognized globally for improving the education system in Senegal. So perhaps we can hear the video from the minister. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Honorable parliamentarians, I am pleased to be able to address you at the launch of the International Parliamentary Network for Education today. This network launches at a critical time for education as we battled the impacts of COVID and focus on ensuring children can keep learning until all school can reopen safely around the world. Before COVID struck, we faced a global learning crisis. That crisis has been made worse Follow. Uh -huh. In my personal experience as former Minister of Education in Senegal and Vice Chair of the Global Partnership for Education, I know that parliamentarians' influence cannot be overstated. The political momentum parliamentarians create changes legislation, increases budgets, and drives equity and quality in education. The next year is a critical time for education sector. Working together, you must be bold and ambitious in order to leave no child behind. It nets three policy priorities will be critical areas of focus as the world moves through the COVID pandemic. Focusing on education financing, equity and quality will be essential to ensuring education for every child. Domestic financing provides the majority of funds for national education budgets globally. From my time as a Minister of Education, I saw how essential it is for aid and donor funding to be aligned to a government's own priorities and leadership through national education plans. The Global Partnership for Education supporting government-led and nationally driven approach through its partnership. In the coming year, the International Parliamentary Network on education has a powerful opportunity 
to get behind and support GPE's partnership for KIST model globally and nationally in order to transform education systems. Globally, we need a concerted political effort to ensure education gets the resources and financing that are so urgently needed. GPE financing campaign and conference next year is one key part of this. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much uh, to you, Minister, for your support. And I'm now delighted to introduce the first of our keynote speakers, Yasmin Sharif, the De De Director of Education Cannot Wait. Yasmin is spearheading Education Cannot Wait and their effort to transform the delivery of education in emergencies. It's an absolutely crucial part of the humanitarian agenda. And with rising levels of conflict and record levels of forced displacement, it's absolutely essential that we do not forget the importance of education for every child. Yasmin, the floor is yours for five minutes. Thank you very much uh, and congratulations to you, um, the MP Harriet Bornwin and Senator um, Dr. Gertrude Inema for, for founding this very important uh, network and we are honored that Education Cannot Wait to be part of it and thank you to Joseph and, and, and uh, Stephen Twig and others who played an instrumental role in making this happen. We think that this is a truly powerful group that can change the global landscape. I think as was mentioned before on education, it's not just a national issue, it's a global issue. Now education cannot wait. Now, education cannot wait is, is the very first global fund that was created specifically for those left borders behind and from our perspective those who are affected by armed conflict and we speak about over 30 countries. Um, the children of Afghanistan, uh, the children of the Rohingyas, the refugees, uh, the, the children of the Sahel, of Central African Republic, uh, of, uh, of Yemen, of Syria, uh, Lebanon, the refugees. Those who are left for this behind because either their governments are unable or unwilling to deliver the basic service of education to them. In some countries, they may actually be the one that are targeting the schools and the girls leaving the schools um, uh, or children living in an opposition area. In many countries though where we work are great ministers of education, but they simply can't cope with it by themselves. They are in the middle of a conflict or they have uh, an enormous refugee caseload entering the country. So they turn to the international community for help. And that's where education cannot wait comes in. Those left borders behind in countries of refugees and uh, armed conflict. Now, we were created at the World Humanitarian Summit. And, and the reason for creating was actually Gordon Brown, who is the chair of the high level steering group, and many of you who are around uh, the table today were part of driving the agenda of establishing education cannot wait. Because back then, only 2.4% of humanitarian funding would be allocated to education. And very little was happening in conflict and crisis countries because you have to deliver in a whole different way when you're in a crisis. Uh, so we were created to mobilize political support and catalyze funding for education in countries of crisis and emergencies. It doesn't make education humanitarian activity. It is a basic service, it's a development activity, but it's about bringing it to the children left bodies behind in crisis. Today, we have managed to shift the humanitarian financing of allocations in country from 2.4% to actually 5.1%. So we see a trend uh, and we have worked very closely with OCHA and Mark Lowcock uh, in shifting that trend. Um, we have also been able to mobilize about $650 million 
into the trust fund, which has been dispersed across um, um, over 30 countries that are affected by conflict. In addition, we have uh, mobilized an additional 150 million inside those countries where donor consortiums come together and also provide um, at the local level support to what we call ECW facilitated joint programs where UN agencies and the government with all the capacity support we give to them and civil society work together to deliver quality education and uh, towards relearning outcomes. So speed is one of our added value. We can move very, very fast. We move fast because we mobilize all the humanitarian and development actors that are used to work in humanitarian crisis to support a government that is unable to deliver that basic service without international support. Now then comes COVID-19. So you're suddenly, they, these children, and there are 75 million of them, of whom 39 million are girls. Suddenly, they're not only having their schools bombed, not only are they sitting in a, in a refugee camp, uh, not only are they displaced, um, chased by militia or terror groups, uh, not only have they lost their families and their mothers and their siblings in the middle of the abnormal phenomena of conflict and crisis and displacement, on top of it comes COVID-19. You ask yourself, how much more can you give? Uh, how much more can a child or a young person endure? And how much more can you expect the government that has been in a protracted crisis like that, maybe for 30, 40 years like Afghanistan or in the Sahel to cope with this? So we moved very fast when the World Health Organization was declaring the pandemic. And by April, we were dispersing our first round of COVID-19 investments to 26 countries affected by crisis. And by July, we had done our second round and have now delivered support to the COVID-19 response to 35 countries. This entails remote learning, where you can use technology, we use technology. But you know, most of Sub-Saharan Africa, most parts of a country like Afghanistan or Central African Republic or South Sudan do not have the capacity with sophisticated technology for remote learning. So we have also had to support enormously non-technology uh, remote learning uh, as a response to COVID-19. Because, yeah. because we are operating with crisis-affected children, we have a very big component of mental health and psychosocial services, hygiene and sanitation, yes, upgrading classrooms to provide um, this. Um, yeah, it was society yeah. there. Sorry, upgraded classrooms to also provide a space for social distancing and empowering uh, the teachers uh, to train them in how to manage the situation and also making sure that their salaries are not being cut because of COVID 19. Now, to conclude, what can we do together? But this is, a, this is a, I probably spent too much time, but what can we do, we do together? We are very happy to, to support and invest in the international uh, net, uh, parliamentary network for education. And we believe because of the, the, the economic recession that we see today that is, is, is the biggest in our generation, um, it, it will be a tendency to look at this from a point of greed and nationalistic responses. But we think that the deep global recession is also an opportunity to look at it from a deep global moral choice. And we, we look forward to work with you um, to actually shift and transform the whole way political leaders today look at interest, national interest. But without education, you can, sorry, without education, there can be no peace and stability, there can be no good governance, can be no socioeconomic recovery. Without education, there can be no sustainable development goals. It's not an issue of prioritizing this sustainable development goal or that human right over education. Education is the foundation for all uh, other sustainable development goals. And I, let me conclude. I think this is the shift we have to take when we go out and mobilize resources. And I can tell you, crisis countries are absolutely dependent on ODA resources. They are the ones that need the ODA resources out there. But let me conclude with Horace Mann. I came across a very beautiful wording um, or a quote by him the other day. Horace Mann was the American education reformer. Because most political leaders today uh, who are elected, they look to, to win election victory, right? 
And that's why the world looks the way it looks today. What you can do as parliamentarian, as the voice of the people, is to do what Horace Mann once said. He said, be ashamed to die until you have won some victory for humanity. And I think that should be the message, along with the positive encouragement to reach those borders left behind with massive unleashing of ODA funding for education in crisis. Thank you. That's uh, wonderful, Yasmina. Thank you so much for those inspiring words and for everything that your team at Education Cannot Wait is doing in humanitarian situations around the world. And I now want to bring in Alice Albright, who's the Chief Executive of Global Partnership for Education. Uh, it's um, a role that she's held uh, since 2013. Um, she's overseen the Global Partnership to, uh, for Education to become a major delivery agency for the Sustainable Development Goals, working in 68 different countries to champion inclusive education and uh, having mobilized more than seven billion dollars to education which has given millions of children uh, the chance to receive an education. Alice the floor is yours for five minutes. Please unmute yourself Alice. We are struggling to hear Alice at the moment. So I'm going to park that and hope we can sort out the technical details, Alice. Um, we're going to open the floor for some brief interventions and points from members of parliament. Um, there are so many colleagues on the chat expressing an interest in uh, contributing. Um, so I'd like to uh, call on uh, colleagues um, and uh, start with uh, uh, Mrs. Shinkai Karohai MP, who's a member of the National Assembly of Afghanistan. Uh, she was an education activist, especially for girls' education, well before she entered Parliament. She was a founding member of the Afghan Women's Education Centre, and she brings that passion to the Afghan Parliament, which we will give a, get a glimpse of uh, now, uh, where we give the floor to Shinkai Karahal MP for up to two minutes. The floor is yours. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Madam Chair, for giving me a chance to uh, intervene. Uh, the quality education in Afghanistan, we really, as an Afghan woman, a member of parliament, we understand the values of uh, uh, quality education. Uh, because still we, uh, and also there is a question how we can uh, quantify the quality uh, education in our country because still we have uh, uh, many classes which doesn't have like a proper school building. They are uh, studying under that simple tent. Or still we, we have to think about uh, the, the textbook or the, the curriculum we are uh, 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 teaching our uh, children and also the uh, Having the professional or qualified teacher, uh, how they impart to our children. So, uh, so it means the quality education. We have to quantify how. What does it mean in our country, the area where I am belong to? Because still, Afghanistan is suffering from um, 40 years of conflict. Still, we have places where, where there is no girls' school, uh, especially, and also some in some area even we don't have a school for boys. Maybe everyone is aware that we're also heading towards uh, Doha for a peace talk with the Taliban, which is uh, simply they are uh, against poor education and even their spokesperson talk about how uh, they will not allow the, uh, to, the, the uh, poor education system. So it means, again, they want to like uh, somehow deprive girls from education. So this is the biggest concern. It's not only about the quality, but also uh, we, are we should talk about the quantity of education uh, or the number of children uh, going to school. Still, uh, more than three and a half million children are uh, deprived to go to formal education. So one thing, and second thing is that uh, uh, how we can uh, uh, like evaluate on uh, uh, the, the, the listen or like uh, the, uh, the teacher, uh, like uh, teaching our, uh, our, our children. So by the end of the day, uh, uh, 
we really we reach uh, uh, the quality of education we are expecting our teachers should uh, transfer that knowledge or education to our children. So the, this lack of mechanism on how uh, evaluate this the, this quality of education. And secondly, what is we really can define the quality of education and uh, in uh, in a country like Afghanistan. So where is there is no proper school in many area where there is maybe lack of the textbook or lack of the professional teachers. Thank you so much. And um, I uh, believe that we have Alice Albright back on the call uh, now. Is that right, Alice? Can we hear you now? Harriet, we can't see her. I suggest that you go to the next intervention okay. from the floor. All right. So um, thank you. I'm going to uh, bring in um, a, another fantastic advocate for education, this time from uh, Nigeria. Um, Honorable Professor Julius Ihomvbere, who is an OON in Nigeria, is also chairman of the House of Representatives Committee on Basic Education and Services in the Nigerian National Assembly. Now, we're all familiar with uh, uh, Boko Haram. It's worth reminding ourselves this means that Western educate the words mean Western education is a bad thing. And therefore, it's so important that in Nigeria, we hear the voices in favor of education. So the floor is yours, our Honorable Professor. You mean you may want to unmute as well. We've really got the gremlins here today, haven't we? In terms of uh, uh, of screens freezing, have we have we got uh, Alice back on the line? Alice. Uh, hi. Yes. Can everybody hear me now? Yes, thank goodness we can, Alice. We're, uh, we're, uh, we're, we're hoping to hear from you. Yes, uh, apologies. I had to switch, switch from one to another. Uh, anyway, good morning, good evening. Uh, it's wonderful to see everybody. Uh, let me start by uh, offering huge congratulations uh, to everybody involved in getting IPNED started. I remember when I uh, met with everybody about a year ago, uh, when IPNED was really just a twinkle in everybody's eyes, and to see uh, this many uh, parliamentarians uh, having uh, uh, joined, uh, Honorable Musarevi from uh, Kenya, uh, Harriet Baldwin, of course the Honorable Harriet Baldwin. What a thrill. So huge congratulations to, uh, to you, Joseph, and to Stephen, who I think is uh, in one of the background, um, the background screens. So well done. Let me just make a few very brief comments. Uh, COVID has certainly created an unprecedented education emergency. And of course, at its height, uh, 1.6 billion learners were out of school. Uh, currently, that number has come down because uh, countries are slowly uh, beginning to reopen schools. Uh, but we've seen, certainly as a result of COVID, uh, how vulnerable education is. And that's a lesson, I think, to all of us as we think about uh, not only the accomplishment of the SDGs, but the impact of COVID uh, going forward. Now is the time to think about how to transform education systems, uh, to think about innovation, to think about scale, to think about better delivery, and to think about all of the things that we've seen become so vulnerable uh, in the past few months. The longer the schools are closed, the more learning will be lost. Uh, it will be harder to get children back to school. Uh, the more girls will most likely be out of school uh, and not ever be able to go back to school uh, due to uh, more early childhood marriage, uh, more teenage pregnancies. So even though we're beginning to see uh, some of the uh, schools reopening, which is good, I think that the long-term impacts of this are gonna be with us uh, for quite some time. So IPNED comes to us, I think, at a critical moment and will uh, very much share journey. Oops, I've got all these things. Uh, a shared journey as we focus together uh, GPE is a shared community of partnerships and investments to strengthen uh, government's capacity to deliver education better. Uh, we put together our own COVID response uh, towards the end of March. Uh, we mobilized uh, between March and May uh, $500 million 
uh, to help countries overcome the impacts of COVID on education. Uh, thus far, we've approved over 50 grants to countries totaling about $430 million, and I expect that we'll exhaust uh, the full $500 million uh, within the next uh, few weeks. Uh, and so we've been able to really move to help countries uh, overcome the impact of COVID. Uh, in general, the money is used for four things. One is distance learning across a range of technologies, uh, helping girls get back into school, uh, helping, helping schools reopen safely, and helping countries invest in the resilience of their education systems going forward. Uh, so a lot of work to be done still, however. Uh, let me think a little bit uh, and share some reflections with you about IPMED and why we're so excited uh, about IPMED. In many ways, one of the challenges around education is a challenge of political will. Uh, it's the political will to mobilize money, uh, both domestically as well as internationally. It's the political will not to take education for granted. It's the political will to reach every child, whether or not they're a girl or a child with disabilities or a child in a, a refugee uh, camp, as Yasmin has told us uh, very much about. Uh, think about the Rohingya. Uh, or it's a child with disabilities in a remote village. Uh, and so in many ways, it is a ch challenge of political will. We are delighted to have uh, such a broad parliamentary network now to work with to help mobilize political will. And I think that one of the, um, the particularly interesting aspects of it is being able to connect uh, the need for political will at the national level and partner countries with political will and the need to build that political will and sustain it at the global level. So I think the fact that the network is so broad uh, is really uh, very intriguing. Uh, as Harriet has said, we will be uh, shortly launching our finance campaign uh, at GPE. It will be our fourth financing campaign. Uh, we are going to make it a very ambitious one, and this is because we've seen uh, still so much how vulnerable education is. So we look to work with you uh, to really lean into uh, this finance campaign uh, as much as we can. In terms of uh, what it will fund, it will fund transformation. And we're now in the final stages of uh, putting together our strategic plan. And if you look at the details, you'll see that it is very focused on innovation, on scale, on transformation, uh, on equity, and reaching the most marginalized children. Uh, so we're very eager to work with all of you uh, and uh, work with a network that we think will have such an important role to play uh, in many, many places, uh, both around financing as well as around political will. So congratulations to all. Easy to get things started, uh, but we very much look forward to working with you. And thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Thank you so much, Alice. And I'm glad that we persisted. And uh, we've also persisted. Um, with the Honourable Professor Julius Ihon Berry, who, um, if you didn't see it already, wrote a fantastic op-ed for our website uh, on the importance of education and the Nigerian perspective. So the floor is yours, Honourable Professor, for a couple of... Right, plan B uh, um, is that we are now going to hear from another education committee chair, uh, this time from Armenia. Um, the Honorable Mukhita uh, Naira Petian is chair of the Standing Committee on Science, Education and Youth in Armenia. Um, uh, sir, the floor is yours. Right, well, we're not having very much luck with our global uh, internet connectivity, I can see. So what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to open up the floor um, to every participant um, to ask questions. If you could start by putting your question in the chat, um, we will draw on uh, the interventions we've already had and bring in your uh, expertise and perspective from your particular country. And um, if you can uh, say who you are and which country you're calling in from, and then who you would like um, to uh, ask the question of. The first three parliamentarians that I'm going to call on are um, Aroma Alta, Aroma Dutta from uh, Bangladesh, um, who is the first woman 
um, from civil society to serve in the Parliament of Bangladesh. We also have a question from Ibdi Same Azawi from Morocco. And finally, I look forward to a brief intervention from Namena Akbar Aziz, the convener of the Parliamentary Special Committee on Child Rights in Pakistan. Uh, but if I may start with uh, Aroma first. Thank you and good morning, good afternoon to all of you. This is a great pleasure to become one of the member of the Global uh, Education Network because particularly for this no. COVID situation where, I mean, we are all stuck and education is one of the major sector which has been hardly hit. So what we were wondering as parliamentarians, particularly in Bangladesh, and for the rest of the world, that the children are the most affected one, and particularly the marginalized children. The marginalized children, and how to actually promote the non-technology remote learning, which is a big challenge ahead of us. The second question which comes to us for practical purpose is that about that the children should must have access to the vaccine because I think we must start discussing about this policy about a budget within globally for SDG4. And that is, I think, one of the most important, I think, the element that every children must have access to the vaccine whenever it is available because they are all stuck at home. And whenever we're talking about I mean, quality education. Quality education only can happen once the children are back to normalcy and back to school. And we are also uh, facing some problems, which I think mo most of the uh, developed countries are facing that uh, schools are now closed. And because of the people who, are, who cannot afford to send their children uh, are going for early marriage of children. Which which is a very devastating news. And this is something which we have to think ahead of time and violence against children also is increasing. So what I think now that the innovation, the equity and must be a political wheel for strengthening the partnership within the global forums and within the region so that we can have a policy so that those policies which will be able which we will be able to implement just not to i mean come out with policies and papers and how to implement those policies for an inclusive policy dialogue and for quality education for promoting people's empowerment and of course children's empowerment to face this covid-19 situation and how to adjust with this new normal condition so i think we are all struggling but i think because now we have ipnad ipnad i think will be and i consider i'm so very proud and happy to be one of the member of ipnad who can shape the world and make the world understand that education is the most important empowering tool for bringing a generation to overcome this crisis so i think we should be working together. We should be actually making the world understand, including UN agencies and all other donor agencies, and also the civil society, that how we can work together and make this condition. We can come out and overcome this condition. Thank you so much, and thank you to you all, so that we can actually work together with a strong commitment for empowerment of uh, children, empowerment for the marginalized and empowerment for the, particularly the girl children, which is my passion, which is, of course, I consider. Thank, thank, thank you, you so, thank you, Aroma. That was really moving. And I, I think we can ask the secretariat to liaise with other secretariats so that we can all get the information about uh, the uh, prevalence of the uh, 
uh, of, of COVID-19 in children. My understanding from what we've heard here in the UK is that uh, children are much, much less affected than uh, other groups, but we can certainly share that with parliamentarians. I'm going to bring in um, Ibtisam Azoi from Morocco and then um, uh, Pakistan, and then I believe we're back in touch with our colleague from Nigeria. So can we go to Morocco next, please? Good morning, everyone. I just wanted to thank you uh, for uh, taking the initiative of launching a such uh, ambitious uh, network. I have uh, just um, uh, one question, which is uh, very practical, but I think that you, you, you will you will uh, you will abort it. Uh, uh, it's about how we are going to, going to coordinate and to collaborate together, and what is uh, uh, going to be our uh, roadmap, and how the Ethernet the network will be structured. Uh, is it going to be uh, through regional uh, uh, sections, uh, national chapters, etc.? Thank you. Yes, thank you. And um, I know that we're planning um, after this launch to put together a small executive. And then I'm going to introduce you all to the director of uh, the International Parliamentary Network for Education, Joseph Nano O'Reilly, who's going to just outline very briefly, Joseph, um, how the network uh, will be a resource for parliamentarians. Um, uh, thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Well, everyone, congratulations. It's wonderful to see you all today. Absolutely exceptional turnout and lots of interest. Essentially, we want to work with all of you to strengthen your hand as national advocates, help you to reach out across parliamentary uh, lines in your parliaments to generate a better consensus for education in your national setting, and then to help you um, to work with your colleagues across national boundaries regionally and internationally. Uh, we want to do that in a variety of ways and we're also preparing a little guide to collaborating with and being part of the network which we'll send you uh, in the coming week or so. But essentially we also want to identify opportunities which you can get behind to support education um, and collaborate with your colleagues. We also anticipate that some of you and some of you have already mentioned this will have particular interests uh, some of you have mentioned the critical issue of the digital divide, others girls' education, others particular levels of education like early childhood. And what we'd anticipate is that we would bring all of you together who have a particular interest in an issue to, to work together on that, to develop policy, to share good practice, uh, and to collaborate so that education gets its share of political attention and that together we mobilise political leadership for education. So essentially, we want to hear from you about those ideas, and then we will support that level of collaboration. We're grateful for uh, ECW and GPE on the call today. They have big policy agendas, really important bodies of work, which we also critically, as you've heard today, need to get behind. So lots to do. Be in touch. We've already promised some of you that have been in touch on the chat today that we will be in contact with the issues that you've raised, and we look forward to supporting your collaboration nationally, regionally, and internationally on the cause of education. Thank you so much, Joseph. And um, uh, that's, um, uh, I think, uh, uh, going to be a useful resource for all of us. Um, I am um, also just going to put a shout out, given that my colleague from Bangladesh was asking about uh, violence in schools, about the, the Safe Schools Declaration, which the UK signed up to last year. I know many other countries have signed up to, and uh, maybe something that if your country hasn't signed up to yet, you may wish to uh, try and press your government to sign up to the Safe Schools Declaration declaration. So I'm now going to bring in from um, Pakistan. Um, um, kindly. No, any, kindly. Could, no, could kindly. you? I'm very sorry. No, um, if I, I can't um, uh, be, be able to cope with interventions verbally, if you could put interventions in the chat, we will try and come back to, to you. Um, so Kocha I'm going kindly. to... I'm, <laughs> is that, I, I'm going to now bring in from the National Assembly of uh, Pakistan, Mena Akbar Aziz, to make a couple of points. Thank you so much, uh, Harriet. Um, and uh, I think I would like to congratulate um, uh, all of you for uh, creating this network, which, was, which is the dire need um, at the regional level um, and at the global level as well. Uh, looking at disparities and issues 
uh, I think it's very, very important to learn from each other and go beyond learning and working together on uh, the areas that uh, the parliaments uh, work on, which is advocacy, oversight, legislations, and of course, budgeting. So these three or four areas, we should be learning from each other. Some of the countries would be far ahead and some um, behind and some lacking. Um, we are, uh, Pakistan at the moment is in an educational crisis. Fifth largest country with the 22 million children out of school and the marginalized because of the COVID-19 are pushed back, especially girls. And the alarming uh, situation is this, that we do not have the data. We need to create a data for how uh, children have been affected. And of course, all the problems the other countries are like early marriages, Bangladesh was uh, uh, mentioning that, is happening in Pakistan as well because of the corona. And uh, of course, tomorrow schools are opening in Pakistan and we are all very nervous. Um, we do not know how children will be able to follow the SOPs and uh, there is no special budget uh, for corona for schools. So quickly, my point is that uh, we need to, first of all, push for political will. Sitting in the National Assembly, what I've pushed for in the last two years that I've been elected to uh, is giving a voice to the voiceless, always talking about children. And I hear some other members also talking about children as well. We have so many issues that, uh, that impact uh, children and their protection. So, um, so I think that uh, we need to learn from that and to create uh, political will that will uh, create, uh, you know, that will have a, a global body that can influence, which is very important, extremely important uh, uh, to look at the larger picture. Uh, and, uh, and then also one thing I would like to mention here is that, you know, when we are looking at education, not only look at the public sector, but also the private sector in countries such as ours uh, and also some African countries, most African countries, other uh, regional countries, uh, private sector is very, very rampant. So we have to uh, be mindful of that. There's a, this was a small, very small point, but I really wanted to make. And I really want to, uh, I lo look forward to um, uh, working with you and especially um, recognizing that uh, uh, COVID-19 has given us a huge challenge and an opportunity as well to look through our educational systems and we need to do it together and create a body of political will, push for the highest level of political will. That is much needed because I, my last point is that I see in my own parliament, in the Pakistani parliament, that uh, the, the budgets are slowly being cut back on education, not much debate is going on and education does not get that much space that it requires. So we need to bring it back to the center. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was very powerful. We're, we're now going to try one more time for Nigeria to see if my colleague from Nigeria has uh, managed to get a connection. And failing that, we are now going to turn to uh, Mika Sugiyora, who's going to read a message on behalf of Asahiko Mihara an MP from the Japanese Diet. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? We have quite an echo. I don't know if you have more than one device. Yeah, yes. Um, yes. Um, can you hear me? We can hear you, but there's a bit of an echo. I think it's good now. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. okay. Um, I am Mika Sugiura, Deputy Executive Director of Results Japan. Unfortunately, Mr. Mihara is not here because of the LDP presidential election. Now, I will read his message on behalf of him. Uh, my name is Asahiko Mihara, a member of the House of Representatives in Japan. I am very honored to join today's online inauguration event for the 
IPNEG as its founding member representing Japan. I have been working for almost 25 years in the diet. I am the chairman of the parliamentary network on the World Bank and I am also serving as the acting chairman of Japan, a parliamentary friendship association. Therefore, I have had a lot of opportunities to visit African countries, including Kenya, which is the mother country of Senator Dr. Musuru Inima. Education is now being affected by spread of COVID-19. Education has been the basis of economic development for all countries, including Japan. I am now studying about education and GPE very hard with results Japan. Now I am looking forward to working with you all for IPNED. Thank you very much. Thank you very much from Japan. And uh, I would now like to bring in Giulio uh, Centenero from the Italian Parliament, please. Hello. Thank you for, uh, for inviting me to the meeting. And um, so I will be very, uh, very, um, very straightforward. Uh, today is the first day of school in Italy. We're facing a lot of troubles, especially for the digital divide, because some schools they do, I don't know, two days in school and two days at home and so on. So some schools, they don't have enough um, uh, internet or devices and so on. This is a problem. But what I would like to ask mainly is uh, what can we do practically uh, hands-on to help and foster quality of education uh, using this network because sometimes parliamentary networks are just um, a place where we talk but uh, there are no practical and specific projects so I just would like to understand that and be useful. Very good question and good luck with the return to school in, in Italy. And uh, yeah. Alice, did you want to um, talk about some of the practical things that the GPE is working on? Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Harriet, for inviting me back in. Yes, let me just give you some brief examples. Um, we're, I'll talk about COVID. Uh, we're very concerned about the impact that COVID has had on, uh, on schools, on closings. Uh, so very specifically, we're working on countries invest in distance learning across a range of technologies, but it's principally medium to low tech like radio. Uh, we're working on helping schools reopen safely with uh, hygiene and hand washing and various materials that are necessary. Uh, we're reaching out to uh, communities that need to get more funding uh, to get girls back into school and also the campaigns around that. Uh, and also working on uh, some additional social campaigning around uh, getting girls back to school who have been uh, pregnant. So there's a range of, uh, of things that we're working on, uh, specifically around COVID. Uh, we're just finalizing our strategic plan, which will be very much around transforming education. And this is where uh, countries will be looking at the specific barriers that they face to uh, enabling children to get a quality education and will be able to provide funding to countries to invest in those areas that will improve uh, quality. Uh, we're working with the private sector, we're working with uh, all of our partners uh, in country uh, as well, so a range, a range of things across the, across the picture. Brilliant. Now, um, given our technological challenges, I'm going to bring in uh, Honourable Dominic Chome from Sierra Leone, and then I'm going to hand the floor back to my co-chair uh, in Kenya to wrap up the, the meeting. Uh, so, Sierra Leone, are you able to join us? The floor is yours. Yeah, good afternoon. Yeah, um, it's a laudable event. 
particularly with Sierra Leone, our government has declared uh, free quality school education, which was launched in 2018, August 20. And then, like somebody presented from the National Statistics uh, Survey, MIG 6, conducted in 2017, it is uh, clear that we have even reputation. Well, I, I'm sorry that the Sierra Leone, the connection seems to have frozen, but I am... It's more in the rural area of Parliament. Hello? Hello? Yeah, so uh, the network of parliamentarians for global uh, support for education is uh, in the right place, particularly for achieving the goal six of the millennium of the sustainable development goals. Our country is almost ahead. We have pronounced free quality school education, but really it requires huge financial implication because we have um, up to one third our, of our population that is in the school going age and uh, most of the parents are poor. We have about 60% of the population of Sierra Leone living below the poverty line. So uh, it's a laudable venture. We know that education is key to um, every form of development. So as, as I mentioned, we are committed to this particular network. We've discussed it with the leadership of our parliament. And then, of course, it, is, it, it can interest you to know that for the first time, the government uh, slated 21% of our national budget towards education. Uh, which we are still pushing for an increase. So we see the need for putting finance into education. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's great to hear about the progress in uh, Sierra Leone. Uh, before I bring in my co-chair, Yasmin, did you want to make any final yes, points of, to the yes. network today? Yasmin Sharif. I really well, no, I mean, I can say, I mean, you have, you have two funds who are part of this new thing. And, um, who badly need your support. A global partnership for education and education cannot wait. And we have a very complementary role. So I suggest that um, one, see what our complementarities are and then set out to support both funds uh, because together, together, uh, we can reach um, the majority of people who may never see us, and we may never benefit from love. So uh, we can only do this by coming together, all of us. And we look forward to working with you. And on behalf of education, cannot wait. I'm grateful that we were here. I am invited and we are your partner. And I look forward also to work with you to reach those children who are left behind in conflict and crisis and who are living as refugees. Not to exclude everyone else, but don't forget them. They've been left behind for far too long. Thank you. Well, well, thank you, everybody, and particularly thank you to colleagues who wished to uh, make remarks today. And unfortunately, technology and time have been rather against us. But I'm going to ask my uh, colleague, co-chair, uh, Senator uh, Gertrude Inima from Kenya to uh, make the closing remarks from this remarkable moment when we, as international colleagues, come together to have the uh, foundation of this incredibly important network. Senator, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Harriet, uh, our distinguished panelists and honorable parliamentarians for finding time to attend this wonderful event. And uh, we want to say that it has been really a good moment where parliamentarians have come to share experiences that are happening practically on the ground. We have seen in the case of Afghanistan, there are no textbooks. We have seen also in areas where children are not in school, even the case of Italy where technology is an issue. And I want to say that at IPNED, we want to say that education cannot wait and we must come together and have a global voice to ensure that we are bringing children uh, back to school. 
So uh, I want to thank everyone who has come here. I want to thank uh, the media. And I also want to say that as the fourth estate, the media has a responsibility of ensuring that uh, it is actually setting the right agenda globally and ensuring that our children with disabilities and the vulnerable are actually helped so that they are not left behind so that uh, eventually we are able to meet uh, the promise that uh, we made of ensuring that everyone gets access to education and not only education but quality education and i also want to say that colleagues everywhere uh, we want to say that uh, we need the political goodwill we need politicians and legislators to ensure that uh, we are pressing governments to uh, put in resources to education. We are also ensuring that uh, we are reaching out to the farthest child behind and we also ensure that the education is quality. Thank you everyone for coming here and we hope to see you soon. Thank you and bye everyone. Bye bye. Thank you all. Good luck. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank Look forward you to so working much. with you. Looking forward. Thank Looking you. much forward. Thank you, Bangladesh. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam. We would like to work together. Thank you for it. Great to see you all. Appreciate you. Thank you all. Thank you. Appreciate Stay safe. All of thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. And thank you for coming, everyone. Thank you, Madam.